welcome to Shelf Help, a channel dedicated to talking to the void about whatever book I happen to be reading. I'm your host, the reader. The following review will contain spoilers. Kalapolis is a kingdom in transition. Ten years ago, a revolution ousted the dragon lords, violently. Few escaped with their lives, and one ended up in an orphanage in the slums. In the years that followed, the caste system was replaced with a merit-based testing system. People are divided into four rings. Iron, unskilled labor, and bronze, skilled labor, make up the bulk of the population and are the poorest. Silver and gold, made of the military, scholars, and government officials, make up the smaller, richer portion of the population. Instead of being born into a caste, everyone takes a test to prove where they best serve. All this under the guidance of the first protector and leader of the revolution, Atreus Athenatos. In his world, anyone can rise to greatness. With the dragon lords dead, he allows children of all castes to test to become new dragon riders. Raised to exemplify, and in some cases enforce, his vision. The story follows two young orphans, turned dragon riders, Lee and Antigon, called Annie. Lee's real name is Leo Stormscourge, youngest son of the former dragon lord Leon Stormscourge. He was dumped at the slum's orphanage on the same day his family died in the revolution. There he meets Annie, who ended up in the orphanage after Leon Stormscourge murdered her family. The relationship is a little fraught, but they end up friends. They both test to become new dragon riders and are chosen by dragons, both train and become top of their class, competing for first rider. Lee has helped Annie navigate the world that only reluctantly welcomes her, and Annie has kept the secret that could get him killed. The two are a study in contrast. Annie is the poster child for the New Order, a peasant girl orphaned by the Dragon Lords, now a writer herself, competing for first writer and leader of the fleet. But she lacks the personal and oratory skills to pass as gold. Lee is the poster child they want. Not only is he an excellent writer, being raised as a noble son gives him all the skills he needs to easily impress the upper crust but he can never let anyone know who he really is. They also provide commentary on the New Order. Annie sees the good in the system, pointing out the people who have risen in the ranks, but she's also been kept from much of the public eye. She sees little of the bad. Lee has grown to see how the system improves people's lives, especially the lower class, but he also sees the people who help murder his family become more powerful and how few people actually move up in society. When new dragon riders from the exiled members of the former dragon lord's family appeared, it begins to put pressure on both the new political system and Lee and Annie's friendship. The first riders of the exile is Julia Stormscourge, Lee's cousin and childhood playmate. During a conversation with Lee, she mentions that the new meritocracy sounds okay in theory, but what will happen when pressure is applied? And then they burn the merchant fleet. Turns out she wasn't wrong. With their new trade-based economy, Kalapolis is now looking at a winter famine. Atreus is quick to result to the old methods. There isn't even a suggestion before he sends out his new batch of 17-year-old dragon riders to collect all the food in the farm towns. And when you suspect someone isn't shelling out all they have, well, you just set someone on fire and a, as an example. And when it comes time to distribute the collected food, it's just assumed that the gold-level citizens will get full rations because poets and scholars need full bellies to work far more than farmers and factory workers. The problem with a meritocracy is that it assumes everyone starts from the same level, a situation that is rarely true and certainly isn't here. 
Atreus has a department of propaganda and a newspaper specifically dedicated to feeding the lower classes false information. There's a scene early in the book where one of the writers has to agree with his bronze class family even though he knows it's a lie. The kids from the upper classes go to better schools, get better food, and better housing. Also, the government isn't openly lying to them. So while Annie is correct that there is some upward movement, it is the exception, not the rule. On the other hand, Lee really wants to believe, in part because he wants the bloodshed and loss to be worth something. If a new system can be better, then perhaps he too can be better than his father. While it's only briefly touched on in flashbacks, it takes some time for him to come to terms with the kind father he remembered as the man who burned people alive as a day job. Even Annie says he wasn't vicious about it. He comforted her after her family burned. It was just his job as a dragon lord, an ugly part, but one that needed doing to ensure the peasants stayed properly cowed. And if you are side-eyeing Atreus at this point, you should be. Because while he talks a good game about merit and equality, his actions speak of overthrowing the dragon lords to replace them with children he took from the slums and made into his private army. Not that Annie and Lee have quite put two and two together to make four yet. They're too busy having friendship drama. And thanks, I hate it. I do not like problems that can be solved over a cup of coffee. When the exiles are spotted, Lee has a moment. He has family. They're alive. They have dragons. A moment of shock is completely understandable. Annie goes from zero to treason in nothing flat. Despite stating she understands his shock, she nearly turns him in when they return, and she spends two days mad at him. And then after trying to take that anger out on him during practice, she has an epiphany that maybe he isn't getting ready to turn traitor. At no point in this sequence of events does she just talk to the boy she's known and been besties with since she was seven. You two could take a patrol together, find a nice quiet place, and have a heart-to-heart. -heart. Or a screaming match if you need it. This goes on for most of the book. Will Lee betray us for family? Don't talk to him about it. Assume the worst for no reason. Act like he's at fault for being caught in the middle, and generally be the worst friend possible for not talking to him. Over and over and over again. Until Lee has to reach out before he breaks under the pressure. All because they never just talked. Like the friends we are supposed to believe they are. Either find a better reason for them not to talk, or simply have them not be friends since childhood. Because this is bullshit. I'm going to put this on my second shelf. I like the main conflict. The slow, dawning horror that is Atreus, and Lee's personal struggle. But the lack of even an attempt at basic conflict resolution between Lee and Annie really hurts the story in my mind. If your problem can be solved by characters acting their age and supposed friendship level, you need a different problem. Thank you for your time. I know everyone's mileage will vary, so feel free to leave your thoughts.